<clears throat> well, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, Paul Butler. I, uh, as last month's speaker, I feel like I've known him for a number of years now because he and Jeff Marcy were the first uh, Americans to uh, discover these planets that are out there that we knew nothing about until 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. And uh, uh, Paul received his uh, undergraduate education in physics and chemistry from, uh, let me make sure I get this correct, um, from San Francisco State University, also got his master's degree, and then went on to get his uh, doctorate at the uh, University of Maryland. Um, he has extensive awards, as you can read on the, uh, the announcement. And uh, he's going to tell us today about uh, all, of, well, all about the, uh, the world of extra solar planets. And uh, he has two letters in here, PFS and APF, which we'll learn about more right now. Great. Cool. Thanks very much, and also thanks uh, thanks for inviting me here. This is a real pleasure. Uh, I, uh, I don't get out to... What's that? The pleasure is ours. Oh, that's so sweet. Yeah, I, know, I don't get out to College Park all that often, although I only live about nine miles from here. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, I mentioned at lunch that uh, when we started this business back in the mid-1980s, you could hold uh, an extrasolar planets meeting in a phone booth. In fact, if you went to an astronomy conference, and you said you were looking for extrasolar planets, people would kind of snicker and then move away from you like you smelled bad or like you were a convert to uh, some wacky religion or something. So it's really remarkable um, that uh, extrasolar planets has become one of the main pillars of modern astrophysics with conferences held with hundreds of and, and, you know, the people showing up and the, some large fraction of the astronomical community these days is doing extrasolar planets. So it's, kind of wild uh, for me, having seen this whole thing happen before our eyes. But of course, uh, the idea of extrasolar planets um, goes back quite a bit longer than that. Um, you know, they, they talk, even in ancient Greek times, uh, the philosophers would talk about other worlds. But at that time, of course, um, that's not exactly the same as our current meaning, because in their mind, the Earth was the center of the universe and was not a planet. So at some level, you might say that the first planet ever discovered was Earth when they discovered it. Uh, that we were just like the other planets in the solar system. And one of the earliest people, of course, to publicize this uh, was uh, the uh, Italian monk Giordano Bruno, who in 1584 wrote this incredibly prescient thing. There are countless suns and countless Earths all rotating around their suns in exactly the same way as the seven planets of our system. The countless worlds in the universe are no worse and no less inhabited than our own Earth. Know what happened to him? Yeah, well, you, know, you, you might even say uh, that, uh, that the field was even hotter back in those days. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to talk just briefly about uh, the ways extrasolar planets are found, and then I'll talk about the menagerie of extrasolar planets that have, that have been emerging over the last 15 or so years. Um, the holy grail right now in this business is, of course, directly imaging. To be able to take a photograph of an extrasolar planet, somehow separate it from its, its host star. The reason that this is uh, so critically important is because when you can somehow image the planet directly, then you can do spectroscopy. And once you can do spectroscopy, you can start saying something interesting about atmospheres. You can say whether, for instance, if an atmosphere has water vapor and something like free oxygen or something that's horribly out of thermodynamic thermodynamic equilibrium, then there's a really good chance that it has life. So this is really what people are pushing to. But of course, direct imaging is only ever going to work around the very nearest stars. Because as the star becomes farther away, the angular separation between the planet and the star diminishes, and you can't separate the planet from the star. And in fact, as it is right now, we don't know how to take a direct image of an Earth-like planet. But it's the sort of thing that hopefully, in the next generation, people will solve. Um, Transits have certainly received an enormous amount of uh, publicity over the last couple of years, especially with uh, the wonderful results that have come from Kepler. And I'll show you a transit cartoon here in just a moment. Uh, microlensing I won't really talk much about. There are about a dozen microlensing planets. And they can only find planets around very distant stars, typically more than 10,000 parsecs, 30 or 40,000 light years. And uh, 
they can't be followed up. And then astrometry and Doppler spectroscopy are the two techniques uh, that one can imagine finding planets around nearby stars now. Let me first show you a cartoon of a transit. So in a transit, if you're lucky enough that the planet actually crosses the face of the star as seen from Earth, while the planet is crossing the star, it causes a diminishment of the light from the star. And the amount by which the light is diminished is simply the ratio of the surface area of the planet to the surface area of the star. So we know at a first order, we know pretty accurately what the radii of stars are. So if you can make this transit measurement, you can immediately calculate what the radius of the planet is, and you can thereby get a physical size. And that's the one way we can get a direct physical size of a planet. So this is pretty nifty. The other reason that transits are, there's many reasons transits are cool, but one of the reasons is if you imagine as the planet is transiting the star, to first order, the planet acts as a little black dot. It simply removes light. But to second order, around the annulus of the planet, light from the star is leaking through the outer atmosphere and impressing upon that light the spectrum of the planet. So one can imagine taking a high resolution spectra or spectra in transit and spectra out of transit and the difference will tell you the spectrum of the planet itself. And in this way uh, uh, a handful of uh, elements have now been spectroscopically detected directly from the atmospheres of, uh, of these planets. Usually it's things that you were pretty sure you would find like sodium and uh, uh, now a few examples of water vapor have even been detected. But hopefully this will be improved in the future. So finding planets around nearby stars uh, has been a dream for a long time. I mean, going back to Bruno's time, and of course, just after Bruno, the telescope was invented. And even back in those early days, people were pointing telescopes at stars, hoping to see the little planet right next to it. And of course, that remains a technical challenge that is just beyond our grasp even now. Uh, but planets can be detected around nearby stars not directly, but by the gravitational influence that the planet has on the star. So here is a nifty cartoon that shows, of course, that as the unseen planet orbits the star, it kicks the star into a small counter orbit. The star and the planet are both orbiting the common center of mass. So the way you can hope to detect the presence of the planet is by looking for a star that wobbles. And astrometry uh, is the technique people have been using for most of the last century whereby you simply take photographs of a star field. You've got a nearby star in the foreground and distant stars in the background. The distant stars set the grid, the metric, and you try to find some nearby star that is wobbling uh, against this uh, sea of background stars. Um, sadly, this technique is yet to produce any planets, but people continue to work on it and it's becoming ever closer. The other way that you can detect the gravitational influence of a planet on the star is the Doppler technique. Here we have the unseen planet orbiting the star, kicking the star into the counter orbit. For half of the orbit, the star is approaching an observer on Earth, and the light is very slightly Doppler shifted to the blue or shorter wavelengths. And for the other half of the orbit, the uh, star is moving away from the observer, and the light is Doppler shifted to longer wavelengths. So you're looking for the light from the star uh, to be Doppler shifted red and blue periodically. So this slide is uh, sort of, that piece was, uh, oh, it's a set of glasses right there that's blocking the uh, light. There we go. No, it's not. Maybe it's my computer. Well, there we go. Doesn't really matter a whole lot. Anyways, this is one of these you are here uh, diagrams. Um, and the little point in the middle is roughly uh, where we lie with respect to our own galaxy. We're way out in the exoburbs. Um, and the various techniques uh, work uh, at different distant ranges. Microlensing only works for very distant stars, um, and therefore these stars can never be followed up. They're, they're too faint, and often in, in the case of microlensing, the uh, actual star is never even seen. Um, the transit technique, so for transiting to work, the planet has to cross the face of the star, so the orbit has to be perfectly aligned relative to observers on the Earth. So that takes luck, right? You can actually calculate, assuming or random orbital uh, inclinations, you can calculate just this, like a freshman calculus problem, what the chance of a transit is. And if you want to detect like a planet in an Earth-like orbit, there's about one chance in 200 it will transit its star. 
So if you want to detect these, you have to look at thousands and thousands of stars. So if you want to look at thousands of stars simultaneously, you have to look at stars that are relatively far away. Nearby stars are sort of randomly distributed around us, and in any given telescope field, there's going to be typically zero or one bright star, a nearby star. Uh, so um, most of the transit searches, either the ground-based or space-based, look at stars that are typically more than 1,000 uh, light years away uh, in order to get enough stars in their field that you have a, a decent chance that some of these uh, lucky passages will happen. And in fact, that's also true for Kepler. The Kepler stars were typically about one to 3,000 light years away. Uh, and uh, therefore, it's very difficult to follow up on the Kepler planets. What we're most interested in are these things right here in the center, this little dot, things that are within about uh, 50, 100 light years of us. Because those are the planets that can be followed up. Those are the planets that can be followed up, not just with current uh, generation of techniques, but the, the planets that can be followed up with the next generation of techniques. Planets that can be followed up by astrometry as it improves its precision. Planets that can be followed up with direct imaging and eventually spectroscopy. And then if one wants to go you know, science fiction uh, and imagine that somehow we can fling hardware at the stars, we're going to fling hardware at the very nearest stars. So these are the ones that, that uh, for our group, that we're really focused on. So the heart of our technique, uh, the precision Doppler technique, is a high-resolution shell spectrograph. So you know, there's a telescope. The telescope gathers the light. For us, the telescope is just a light bucket. So we're even bother showing it on this diagram. And the heart of the instrument um, is the spectrograph. So the entry slit to the spectrograph is up here, and the light comes to a focus at the entry to the, to the spectrograph, and then it, the beam diverges until it hits this collimating mirror. It's just a parabolic mirror. It converts this diverging beam into a parallel beam of light where it hits the shell grating. And then it's sent through uh, either a couple of prisms or yet another grating, which are the cross dispersing elements. And then onto a very fast CCD camera. And finally, to focus on a little CCD chip at the back end. The um, extraordinary thing about these spectrographs is they allow you to get full wavelength coverage and very high resolution. Historically, in astronomy, you can only do one or the other. You could get full wavelength coverage, but at very, very low resolution. Or you could get high resolution, but only over a few angstroms. But these images, here's a representative of this, of this sort of uh, work. These images, they stack the various wavelengths on top of each other, so that each strip of light, in this case, is something like 50 or 100 angstroms. And you can imagine cutting along the black lines between the stripes of light and gluing it to the one below it and then gluing it to the one below it so that there's a full wraparound spectrum. So what these shells do is they cut the spectrum into like 50 or 100 angstrom chunks and then allow you to stack them so that you can all bring it to a single focus on a, on a single modern CCD. And for the Cognoscetti here, there's the famous uh, H-alpha line. There's the sodium doublet. Um, most of these lines are, this is, this is the sun, so this is representative of a sun-like star. Most of these lines are nickel and iron, but there's also calcium and all the other things that you get in stellar atmospheres. And all of these lines, um, we actually don't care what the element is. It makes no difference to us. For us, these lines simply provide wavelength markers. And we're looking for these little black lines to wiggle back and forth to indicate the presence of a planet. Uh, this, the reason that this was only done, this is well, in the last 15 or so years is because it's actually technically very challenging. Um, Jupiter causes the sun, and the first order you can describe the solar system as consisting of the sun and Jupiter and some garbage. <laughs> <laughs> and Jupiter causes the sun to wobble by a velocity of about 10 meters a second. Historically in astronomy, from the 1920s until the 1980s, measurement uncertainty for these sorts of measurements was about 300 meters a second. So if you're looking for a 10 meter a second signal and you've got 300 meter per second errors, no prayer. So that was the goal, that was where our work started, was how to improve Doppler velocity precision by a, board, a couple of orders of magnitude. Um, and uh, I should also mention that, uh, that even though this is an incredibly high resolution spectrometer, each individual pixel on the CCD represents about uh, two kilometers a second, about 2,000 meters. So, if you want to, our goal is to get down to one meter a second precision or even better. So that's one two thousandth of a pixel. That's about uh, 20 silicon atoms on the CCD substrate. That's the level that we have to achieve 
uh, in order to make these measurements. So technically it's very, very challenging. I always like to show a picture of uh, Steve Vogt at this point. Uh, Steve is uh, my closest collaborator. Um, he's the guy who literally invented modern shell uh, spectroscopy, uh, initially at Lick Observatory uh, on the uh, three meter telescope. And uh, subsequently he built high res spectrometer on the Keck 10 meter telescope. And he's just recently finished the APF spectrometer, which I'll talk about a little bit later. What's in his hand? What's that? What's in his hand? Oh, uh, he's, uh, this is for a newspaper article, and so he's holding a mirror here uh, just to look science fiction-y. Uh, <laughs> so the one like piece of... Yeah, yeah, it does. That's what I was thinking. The one, the one piece of hardware that we invented uh, to go along with this is an iodine absorption cell. Uh, the, it's a, made out of Pyrex. It's about the size of a Campbell's soup can, uh, and it's evacuated inside, uh, and there's about one one thousandth of an atmosphere worth of iodine vapor. And the temperature is above about 40 degrees centigrade that the iodine is entirely in vapor phase. Um, and we mount that directly in front of the entrance slip to the spectrometer. So the light from the star goes through the iodine cell prior to entry into the spectrometer. Now to make this technique work, uh, we have to know the underlying spectrum of our iodine absorption cell incredibly precisely. So we take our cells, in fact there is an iodine absorption cell, we take these uh, to NIST up the road here in Maryland uh, to the atomic physics lab where they have a Fourier transform spectrometer. These Fourier transform spectrometers are really amazing. You can see just a piece of it. This, the spectrometer is actually about the size of this room. And it sits in a giant evacuated tank. Uh, and these things can return a resolution in excess of a million uh, with incredibly high signal to noise. Uh, we need this huge, super bright light source here to get the signal to noise. And this is uh, Julian Nave who runs the atomic spectroscopy lab there. You know, without, without this instrument and without somebody like Julian, this, this work would be hopeless. So this is what our data actually look like. Uh, we take this spectrum, which basically covers, the iodine provides absorption lines between 5,000 and 6,000 angstrom, so right in the middle of the visible, sort of yellow-green. And uh, we break the spectrum up into little two angstrom chunks, and we analyze each two angstrom chunk separately. And over two angstroms, this is what a typical bit of iodine spectrum looks like. This is from the Fourier transform spectrometer. So this thing looks like noise, looks like grass. But in fact, every wiggle here is real. This is a resolution of a million and a signal to noise of about a thousand. Uh, and that's the underlying spectrum of the iodine. This is what a typical sun-like star looks like. So you see absorption line, a strong line, a strong line, there's a little buddy line in the wing, there's a weak line. And then this is what uh, the dots here are what we actually observe when we observe the star through the iodine absorption cells. So you see stellar line, stellar line, stellar line, stellar line. But for instance, here in the star, that's continuum. So that is actually due entirely to the iodine. And uh, so here again is a case where that there is mostly that. You'll notice this incredibly beautiful, well-resolved iodine when seen in the star is all smeared out. That's because the Fourier transform spectrometer is a resolution of a million. And with the sort of astronomical spectrometers we have, we're getting a resolution that's sort of in the ballpark of typically 50 to 100,000. So it's smearing out the signal. And then we build a model, literally of every single pixel in which we start with the spectrum of the star that we observe at the, sp uh, the spectrometer at the, at the telescope, the FTA sp spectrum of the uh, iodine cell, and we use this to map the wavelengths. The star gives us the Doppler shift, uh, and we have to solve for the wavelength scale, which we get from the iodine, and we have to also solve, this is a pain, but we have to solve for the point spread function of the spectrometer. Because the spectrometer is not perfect, um, you know, if you put a laser beam into a spectrometer, all the light doesn't fall on a single pixel. It gets smeared out into a roughly Gaussian shape, which is the point spread function, the smearing function of the spectrometer. And that smearing function changes from minute to minute. The temperature of the spectrometer is changing. The air pressure of the spectrometer is changing. The light on the entrance to the spectrometer is wiggling back and forth because the guiding isn't perfect. And they all contribute to this changing point spread function. 
So we ask in a mathematically forward modeling sense, what smearing function do we need to map that into that? So we're solving for about typically about 15 free parameters in order to get the one parameter we care about, the Doppler shift. So imagine that we're aliens looking back at the solar system. Uh, what would we see? Uh, this shows uh, what the signal, the sort of signals that we might hope to get on the solar system. Uh, you'll see that there, there, the first order, there's this sinusoid, which is a period of about 12 years. That's Jupiter. And then you'll notice that, for instance, the peak of the sinusoid goes down and up and down. Uh, and uh, that by, amount by which it goes up and down is about 3 meters a second. And it's got a period of 29 years. That's Saturn. So the uh, measurements we get from this, we get the orbital period. You can literally read the orbital period of the planet right off of the chart. And you get the semi-amplitude. And those things together, along with the orbital shape, tell you now the mass of the planet. And from this, we could also probably infer, with our level of technology, the presence of Saturn, assuming we had 29 years of data. Uh, so uh, our own life expectancy has become a real problem uh, with this. Uh, finding, finding Jupiter and Saturn analogs is actually really hard because of the time scales involved. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, but hopefully by the end of my life, uh, we'll have a handful of these things. So, prior to the discovery of extrasolar planets, everybody knew that all extrasolar planetary systems would look just like our own. That there would be giant <laughs> planets further out, there would be small rocky planets in close, they would all travel in nested concentric circular orbits, just like the solar system. So it was really quite a shock when the first planet was announced in 1995 to see this thing, 51 peg. Uh, and you can, this, this is time and days, so you can read the period directly off here. It's about four days. And the mass of the thing is about a half a Jupiter mass. So here we have a giant planet, 150 Earth masses, in a four-day orbit. Uh, this was totally unheard of. Nobody had predicted this thing. Nobody, no, no astrophysicist. Uh, no, uh, no Star Trek producers, no, uh, uh, nobody. So, um, for me, this is, I think about this a lot. The menagerie of planets that has emerged has almost nothing, no connection to what we, we imagined they would look like prior to their discovery. And uh, it, whenever you're trying to extrapolate from a, a class of objects, knowing of only one object, you're actually worse off than if you knew of no objects. Because your thoughts are so guided uh, that you can't get off the track. And, uh, and this is yet one more example of the fact that uh, humans actually don't have very much imagination. <laughs> one, of the, one of the nifty things about 51 peg type planets, or, or as they're sometimes called hot Jupiters, is you can actually have a nice scale model that fits on a single piece of paper. Uh, being a Jupiter-class planet, it's about one-tenth the diameter of the star, and at four-day orbital period, it's at about 10 or 11 radii from the star. So the whole thing fits on a single piece of paper. You know, you try to draw this, uh, something that size for the sun, and then try to put Jupiter on that same diagram, and Jupiter is like out at, in West Virginia somewhere. Uh, so the whole thing is really cool. And when these things were first discovered, of course, they're hot. In this case, you know, you estimate the temperature is something like 1300 to Kelvin. And people said, wouldn't it photo evaporate? Well, why does this thing even exist? Turns out you can do the calculation. Uh, the escape velocity of hydrogen from something that's an order half a Jupiter mass is about uh, 55 kilometers a second. And the actual thermal velocities of the hydrogen atoms in this planet are going to be of order five or six kilometers a second. So you do slowly lose hydrogen. But over the main sequence of life of the star, you only lose about 1% of the mass. So the other really bizarre class of planets to emerge uh, were these eccentric planets. And this, again, was one of the very first planets, uh, 16 Sig B. And the first thing you'll notice, well, the period, again, is like a border about two years, about 100 days. And the uh, semi-amplitude is about 50 meters a second. So this thing is a little bit less than two Jupiter masses. But the shape of the curve is decidedly non-sinusoidal. It looks like a sawtooth. 
So that tells you about the eccentricity of the planet. In this case, the eccentricity is quite extreme. It's nearly 0.7. So when this was first announced, people, first of all, people didn't doubt this because the signal is so strong. But they still said this is a complete oddball, that things like this must be really very rare because everybody knows all planets are in circular orbits. And they said, okay, look, 16 sig B, turns out this star in the bright star catalog of the 9,000 brightest stars in the sky, this is the star that is most like the sun. You can overlay its spectrum on top of the sun and it looks virtually identical. Um, but there is a 16 sig A, a companion star, that's at about 1,000 AU, about 1,000 Earth Sun radio uh, distances away. And they go, okay, so there's this companion star, and over billions of years, the companion star has been gravitationally perturbing the orbit of this planet. It started out circular, and it got perturbed into this crazy eccentric orbit. So it's an oddball, and we don't need to worry about it. And then, of course, like about 70 or 80% of all the planets that were subsequently discovered were eccentric. So, once again, that really shows our lack of imagination. So, back, uh, yeah, this is a nifty diagram that shows what these eccentric planets would look like if you overlay them on top of the solar system. Uh, the uh, orbit actually goes inside of the orbit of Venus and then well beyond the orbit of Mars. So, for those people who, uh, who really, life is what it's all about, these are really crappy systems for life. Uh, if, first of all, it's two Jupiter masses, so nobody imagines it would have life anyway. But even if it was a smaller planet that might have water, for part of the orbit, the oceans would boil, and for the other part, they would freeze. And uh, life would have to be pretty hardy to deal with that. Now, back in the old days, you find a couple of crappy high-mass planets, and you make the cover of Time magazine. Uh, <laughs> sadly, uh, those days are gone. You work much harder now to find much smaller mass planets and it hardly gets any attention at all. So, um, to just briefly review uh, the first decade of extrasolar planets and, and set up the rest of the talk, there's this slide. Uh, in the first decade, starting in the mid-1990s, we finally had beaten our measurement errors down to about three meters a second. Uh, and this led to, of course, the, the initial discovery of, of, of giant extrasolar planets. Uh, the whole bizarre new classes of planets emerged, these hot Jupiters and these eccentric planets. Uh, and uh, if that's all we had, then this field would be pretty boring. Um, so we really have been pushing hard to get much higher measurement precision. We're trying to get to one meter a second. And I think we've achieved that. And I'll show you some slides here in a few minutes. And uh, whole new classes of planets continue to emerge, including this new class of planets called super-Earths and another class called hot Neptunes. Uh, and uh, we're right now uh, right on the edge of discovering potentially habitable planets. Um, so let me uh, just talk about some of the problems with getting to one meter a second precision. Um, one meter a second is really tough. It's really tough, you know, technically to make the level of measurements. You're trying to literally uh, shift out uh, error sources down at the 20 uh, atom level, uh, 20 silicon atoms on the CCD substrate. But on top of all of the technical issues, there are astrophysical issues that, that may ultimately or will ultimately set the floor of our measurement precision. Stars pulsate. When I was in grad school, they used to tell me that uh, the sun has a five minute pulsation period, but that the amplitude was about uh, 25 centimeters a second. And I thought, okay, great, who cares, 25 centimeters a second, that's never going to be an issue for me. Mm -hmm. uh, it turns out that that statement is only true to first order, that the second order, the, these pulsation amplitudes can be much larger. And this is a series of observations we made of Alpha Centa A using uh, VLT, the very large telescope in Chile, uh, in the mid-2000s. They actually gave us uh, four straight nights to observe one of the very brightest stars in the sky, with one of the very biggest telescopes in the world. Mm -hmm. and uh, for much of that time, the velocities were totally flat, but here's the 80-minute sequence in which you can see the pulsation period. It's seven minutes. You don't even need a periodogram. You just read it right off the chart. And what happens is stars are beating. They're like bells. They're ringing uh, with millions of modes. And uh, for much of the time, those modes are, uh, are destructive, and the velocities are relatively flat. But on, on timescales of an hour or two, these major modes can occasionally be constructively. 
and in which case you get this huge <coughs> signal, this sort of one to two meter a second signal. So if you're trying to make measurements at the level of one meter a second, and the star is varying by two meters a second, that's a problem. Now, uh, this problem you can get, get around. Uh, it means that it, it, you have to observe the star uh, for more than a pulsation period. So sunlight, sun is five minutes, the star is seven minutes. Uh, Subgiants get up to periods of about 15 or 20 minutes. But if the star is very bright and your observation would normally be very fast, you have to sit on the star and take a series of observations to average through this. So this is one source of, of astrophysical noise that's a pain in the ass. Uh, another source is granulation. The star is this giant convective ball of gas where you have these rising blobs of gas. Uh, and they're rising because they're hot, so the light from them is blue shifted and they're producing more light than the corresponding blobs that are falling, which will be red shifted. And that gives you uh, a net blue shift signal, which varies with time. And the time scale for this granulation is sort of an hour or two. So um, you can try to hit a star several times a night in order to average to this granulation time scale, but then suddenly you don't have very much telescope time. You start spending an hour or more per star. So this is a problem. Then, of course, finally, stars rotate. They have rotation periods of anywhere from a few days to several months, and they have spots. So if a spot is on the edge of the star that's approaching the observer, that edge is normally going to have light that's blue shifted, but the light from the spot will block some of that, and the star will have a net red shift. And correspondingly, if you have an excess of spots on the, on the receding limb of the star, you'll get a net blue shift. And this has time scales of the things that you're looking for, the planets. Mm -hmm. So there, there will be an astrophysical floor to how precise we can make these measurements. And I suspect we're approaching that right now. I, it'll be hard to make measurements to better, I think, than a half a meter a second. So, of course, the real excitement in this field is looking for potentially habitable planets. Um, everybody would like to find the, the, the buzzword right now is Earth 2.0. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, a one Earth mass orbiting a one st solar mass star in a one AU orbit, AU is the astronomer <laughs> term for Earth-Sun distance, uh, produces on the star about a 10 centimeter a second Doppler shift. Well, this is probably not something that, certainly something we can't detect now, and probably not something we're going to likely be able to detect at any point in the future. But there is, uh, there are other ways, uh, other stars that are more amenable to this. In particular, the red dwarf stars, the so-called M dwarf stars. These are stars that have anywhere from about one-tenth to one-half of the solar mass, and they put out much less light than the sun. The brighter ones only put out about one to two percent of the light that the sun puts out. So because they're much fainter, the habitable zone, the place where liquid water, the, the range of distances from the star where liquid water might exist, is much closer to the star. So for the case of these M dwarfs, the so-called habitable zone is sort of in 20 to 50 day orbits. So that helps in a number of ways. First of all, the mass of the star is smaller, so you get a greater reflex velocity, just Newton's third law. Uh, secondly, the planet is much closer to the star, so it's got a stronger gravitational tug on the star. That again improves the, the signal. And thirdly, uh, you get many more orbits in a shorter period of time, and that improves the ability to recover the signal. So uh, this is a simulation where we take one of these uh, M dwarfs, uh, and we observe it virtually every night over something like about eight months. Imagine that astronomers with, uh, with giant guns storm an observatory and uh, take it over. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we make our little nightly of measurements. And in the simulation, things like weather are taken into account. So there are little spots in here where there's no data. And we added in, uh, one meter a second errors into the simulation so that it would be like real data. And uh, you can take this stuff for eight months. That's about how long you can see a star before it goes back behind the sun. And then at that time, you can take a periodogram. So we installed a 50-day signal in here. There is a 50-day signal. And when you take the periodogram, you see this whopping 50-day signal. You also see all this smaller stuff. These are aliasing problems. Probably a lot of you have run into aliasing problems. Pain in the ass, but uh, you can deal with them. But you do see this dominant 50-day signal. It, it is recoverable. And you can then take this data and phase it to this period, and you see something that's kind of believable. The amplitude here is two meters a second. Um, this is sort of a two-ish meter or two-sigma result, probably a little better than that because there's so many points. 
it's not necessarily something you'd want to jump up and down about, but it's interesting enough that the next time the star emerged from behind the sun, you might start another campaign. And if you did another campaign on this star, and you saw the signal the second year, and they were in phase, that would probably be a legitimate uh, detection. And this is for a 10 Earth mass object. You can do the same thing for a 5 Earth mass object. Uh, now the signal is down to about one meter a second. This thing looks much flakier. And this is kind of like the state of the art. This is kind of where we're at right now, assuming we can get this kind of telescope time. So the problem right now that we've been running into is in the early days you'd find huge planets like Jupiter with whopping signals, and they were, they were easy once you could make measurements of three meters a second. But now we're trying to find much smaller planets. And uh, what we're finding basically is that nature is cruel and vicious, and it doesn't give up secrets easily. That the most interesting planets come in these tightly packed systems, like the solar system. Right in the solar system, basically every stable orbit is filled. And if you throw test particles into the solar system, they all get ejected, because there's no room for anything else. Uh, and so you end up with many, many planetary signals that are all competing. And this requires an enormous amount of data to disentangle. So I'll show you a real example here. This is a 61 Ver. This is a sun-like star that we have been observing with the Anglo Australian Telescope in Australia for many, many years. And we knew it was varying by more than our measurement error, but the signal was wacky and there was nothing we could do to pull it out. Finally, about four or five years ago, <coughs> they gave us a, an observing run it was 48 consecutive nights. We've never had anything like that before. And we were able to start pounding this star on a nightly basis. And we almost immediately could pull out this five-day signal, which has an amplitude of about two to three meters a second, and this uh, longer signal with about a one-month period, and uh, amplitude of, uh, of about five meters a second. And uh, we were finally able to disentangle the signal. But this is not something you can disentangle if you take three or four observations a year. You have to pound this thing on a nightly basis. And so if you look at this uh, system, it turns out this system has three planets. It has the, a five-day planet, uh, which is a mass of about uh, five Earth masses. Uh, this uh, one-month signal, which is a mass of about one Neptune, about 15 Earth masses. And it has a third signal that's longer than the, that data set. Uh, this is a, about a three-month orbital period, uh, and it's about two Neptune masses. Uh, so this is, you know, when this was discovered, this was really wacky. Uh, first of all, it has this whole new class of planets here. In the solar system, the biggest of the small planets is us, one Earth mass. And the next size planets are, are Uranus and Neptune, about 15 Earth masses. They're ice giants. And there was nothing in between, and nobody really had ever speculated there would be anything in between. And now we know that this whole other class of planets sort of is in the ballpark of two to ten Earth masses that are now called super-Earths. These things are probably rocky. Um, they could have water on the surface. They would have a higher surface gravity than the Earth, but not dramatically so. Uh, the surface gravity might be of order of two Earth, mass, two, two Earth gravities, but uh, for bacteria living in ponds of water, it would make no difference. Uh, and then there's this other class of planet uh, here, a Neptune mass object that's in a relatively short orbit. So unlike our Neptunes, it's hot. So there's two other classes of planets here that have emerged from this stuff. And uh, it turns out we now know these things are common. These things are dirt common. In fact, probably systems with hot Neptunes are the most common systems there are. That's one of the things that's come out of, uh, out of uh, the Kepler survey. Probably something like 30% of stars have these hot Neptunes, things that we've never seen in our, that we don't see in our solar system and that we've never imagined prior to their discovery. So uh, we continue to push on. And uh, I've mentioned, of course, that, that the really hot thing in this field right now is trying to find potentially habitable planets. And, and it's good to have a group of physicists here, because generally when you say habitable planets to the public at large, they imagine, you know, Captain Kirk and Spock and, 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 and you know, creatures that look more or less like us. Uh, what astronomers mean when they say potentially habitable is simply that the planet is the right distance from the star that liquid water might exist. Uh, in the history of the Earth, for about 80 or 90 percent of the history of life on Earth, life was single cell creatures living in ponds of water. And that's probably what most life is like in the universe, those simple single cell creatures. 
Um, so we're looking simply for planets that might be in the habitable zone. So here we have an example of a sun, one solar mass, and an M dwarf, which is in the ballpark of about a half of a solar mass. And for the sun, the habitable zone, this is this little blue strip where you can calculate that liquid water might exist. And in this system, you know, Earth is the one thing that's uh, firmly in the habitable zone. Mars, if it had a thick carbon dioxide atmosphere, might potentially be habitable. And Venus is just a little bit too close to the hot edge uh, right now. Uh, but for M dwarfs, as you go to lower mass stars, they put out a lot less light, and the habitable zone comes in much closer to the star. So here is an example of a planet we announced a few years ago that's about uh, three or four Earth masses that falls right in the habitable zone around this M dwarf. Now the orbital period here is something like about 35 days, and the theorists all tell us that a planet that close to the star is probably tidally locked. So that means one face of the planet is always uh, uh, facing the star, and the other face is always pointing towards deep space. So you'd have a hot side and a cold side. That's probably not great for life. Mm -hmm. So in, in the science fiction venue, you're supposed to imagine an annulus around the planet where you're right at the spot where the hot and the dark come together, and that's where you might find habitability on such planets. On the other hand, the fact that theorists tell us that this thing should be tidally locked doesn't particularly bother me. Theorists have been wrong about every last thing in this business. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, pulling out the signal was a real pain. Um, we actually had to combine data from two different telescopes. There's, uh, I forget which is which, I think the red data is from Keck, the world's biggest telescope, and the blue data is from the Swiss Harps project. Uh, and there's about 120 data points from each telescope. And this system is packed. There is a three-day planet, there is a 5.7-day planet, there is a 12-day planet, there is this potentially habitable thing in 37 days, a 67-day planet, and a longer period planet. And finding these things simply takes an enormous amount of observing. Uh, there's just no way around it right now. You just, in this business right now, at the cutting edge, there's two things involved. There's measurement precision and lots and lots of time on the telescope. And there's just no other way around it. So uh, with the goal of pushing to much higher precision uh, uh, and making use of uh, the six and a half meter Magellan telescopes uh, in Las Campanas in Chile, uh, I've been working with uh, two brilliant instrument builders for more than a decade now. Steve Shackman, who was actually the project scientist for the Magellan telescopes, uh, and Jeff Crane. And uh, uh, I helped to raise money for this project. They did all the real work. Shack did the initial design, and Jeff did uh, all the subsequent design and most of the hard work of actually building the planet finding spectrometer, or PFS, for the Magellan telescopes. You don't see it in this photo. But the spectrometer itself, this is when it was still in the lab in Pasadena. And it was sitting right over here. And we wanted to get sunlight into it. So Sheck was sitting here, sunlight streaming through the window, <laughs> simply bouncing light off of a mirror to get it into the spectrometer. So uh, prior to PFS, um, every spectrometer I had ever dealt with was a general purpose of shell spectrometer. Uh, and by general purpose, I mean that uh, Every astronomers would use it for all sorts of projects. So they would do things like they would move the gratings, uh, they would move the cross dispersers, they would you know, move the camera around, they would try to get different bits of wavelength coverage, uh, and these things were typically very large, uh, and, uh, and they weren't thermally controlled, so the temperature is changing, air pressure is changing. So we wanted to build a spectrometer custom built for doing nothing but precision velocities. Uh, and. Uh, First of all, that makes things a little bit easier because now you no longer have any degrees of freedom. You set up the format and nothing ever moves. You don't allow the spectrum, you don't allow the, the optics to move, you don't allow the, the gratings to move, you don't allow uh, the cross dispersers to move because uh, you want stability to make these precision velocity measurements. The other thing that you really, really want is uh, to thermally control the environment. So uh, the design of this thing is uh, it's this brand new design called an, uh, an R4. And uh, what it does is it makes a double pass through the optics. And that allows you to build the thing to be much smaller. Because the problem with thermally controlling something that's large is it's a pain in the ass. Mm -hmm. So if you want to make the thing as small as possible so it can be thermally controlled. So the, 
light from the telescope comes through the entry slit, and then there's a pickoff mirror that sends the beam down through all of the set of optics once to the shell grating, and then back through all of the set of optics, and finally to the CCD camera. So you make this double pass through the optics, and the thing is now physically much smaller than a conventional shell. And uh, this actually shows one wall, so there, at this point the wall is, is open. <coughs> and the thing is physically about the size of a ping pong table. The, the footprint is about the size of a ping pong table now. So we, you can build thick insulating walls. These walls are actually styrofoam. And then you can put heating elements inside of the walls. And at Las Campanas, we're on the very southern edge of the Atacama Desert, but we're at about 8,000 feet. And as a result, the temperature um, never gets above about 25 degrees C. So what we do is we heat the interior of this thing to 27 degrees C. So we have to cool, we always heat. That makes thermal control much easier. And we currently maintain a temperature control of about plus or minus uh, one one thousandth of a degree. And uh, Sheck and Jeff Crane are both want to do better. And I keep thinking, why? But you, know, you, <laughs> you don't tell the instrument builders not to do something. <laughs> and this is what the uh, spectrometer looks like with that one wall removed sitting at the side of the telescope. The telescope has these two Naismith platforms, one on either side. So you've got the primary, bounces the light up to a secondary, bounces the light down to a tertiary, which is a mirror that's at 45 degree angle, so it bounces the light out at a 45 or 90 degree angle to the telescope. And then you've got one of these Naismith platforms on either side. So the spectrometer actually sits on this Naismith platform on the side of the telescope and simply swivels around with the telescope in a, in a gravity invariant environment. So that's also important for our stability. And uh, so you can see the, the whole thing laid out here. And here's the sort of level of precision that we're getting. Uh, this is after uh, four years now. This is one of our most stable stars. Uh, and the, uh, the RMS scatter is uh, one meter a second. And some of that, of course, is due to the star itself. Here's another example. This is a planet that we're about to publish. Prior to using the PFS, or Planet Finding Spectrometer, we were using another spectrometer at Las Campanas called Mike, which was a general purpose of shell, had much lower resolution, didn't have any of these stability uh, things going for it. And uh, this is the signal from Mike going back uh, over most of the last decade, and the RMS is about seven and a half meters a second. Here is the subsequent PFS data that we've been taking since 2010 and the RMS to the capillary fit is one meter a second. So that's what you buy with these fancy new spectrometers. And here is a nifty signal that's emerging from PFS. A uh, 44 day orbital period. Uh, thing is about a Neptune mass uh, and it's mildly eccentric. And we're getting lots and lots of these signals that are now emerging and hopefully we're going to start publishing them soon. So at Magellan, um, it's a six and a half meter telescope. It's one of the bigger telescopes in the world, and it's very competitive to get time on it. Fortunately, Carnegie is a 50% partner in the Magellan project. Uh, Harvard's 20%, MIT, uh, Michigan, and Arizona are all 10% partners. So it's good to be at Carnegie. Um, and with uh, our collaborators, we're currently able to get about 50 nights a year for this project. But as I showed you in these simulations, frankly, you want more time. And uh, at some level, the spectrometer is more important than the telescope. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, uh, I've been working on this uh, APF, Automated Planet Finding Project now, also for like the last 10 years. Uh, this is a 2.4 meter telescope at Lick Observatory in uh, Northern California near San Jose. Uh, and again, this is totally dedicated telescope. This telescope is designed to do nothing but precision velocities. And it has, that's another shot of like, here's, here's APF 2.4 meters. This sort of shows you the difference between current telescope thought and 1950s telescope thought. The dominant telescope at Lick forever has been the old 3 meter telescope, which when it was uh, completed in the late 1950s was the world's second largest telescope. And you walk in here and the dome is huge, you could play a game of football down there. So this is 2.4 meters, this is nearly as big, and yet look at how small the dome is. In fact, the telescope is so tightly wedged into there 
that the only way to get the telescope in or out of this is you have to bring a crane up and bring it out through the top here. Uh, and there's no room for a football game in here. In fact, there's no room to observe in here. Uh, you, you can technically observe in here, but it's actually very dangerous. There's no room at all. And this is always designed to be observed with either remotely or robotically. And just this week, we we're switching over to semi-robotic observations, where the telescope decides whether to open or not, when to close, and it's got a list of objects to observe, and, and people don't need to be around. And the design of this APF spectrometer, uh, this was designed and built by Steve Vogt, and it's based on the exact same design as PFS. Uh, it's at a 90 degree angle for, uh, for technical reasons, but it's, uh, everything is identical. The light comes through, makes a, a pass through all the optics, goes off the shell grating, makes a second pass through all the optics. Uh, so it has all of these, these same design considerations. And uh, like I said before, a constant gravity environment. Uh, a thermalized optical train. So one difference in Steve Vogt's work compared to most instrument builders is Steve likes to not only make his stuff thermally stable, but he likes to furthermore thermal, uh, athermalize his materials so that, you know, you imagine you've got a steel strut that connects two optics. So as, as you heat up, the steel expands, and as you cool down, the steel contr uh, contracts. What he does is he puts these weird alloys in, in, in the spacing in there that have exactly the opposite effect, so that when these weird alloys heat, they contract, and when they cool down, they expand, so that the actual distance between the optics does not change, even if the temperature of the spectrometer changes. Uh, these things are very efficient. Uh, typically, uh, spectrometers built in the 80s and 90s had a throughput of 5 to 10 percent. These modern spectrometers have throughputs that are more typically about 25 percent. So it's like having a telescope that's two and a half times bigger and much higher resolution. Um, and with this spectrometer, we're actually getting a resolution of about 108,000. With PFS, we're getting a resolution of about 80,000. In contrast, with Keck on the world's biggest telescope, our resolution is about 65,000. And at other telescopes like Lick and, uh, and the Anglo-Australian telescope, our resolution is only 50,000. Resolution really helps. So uh, here is, this is just to demonstrate, this, this is a group of physicists, so I get to actually show this diagram, normally I can't show this. Uh, this, this demonstrates what the point spread function of the spectrometer looks like. These, these, these are from real stellar observations, this, these aren't from laser beams or anything, where we observe the star through the iodine absorption cell, and so we can forward model what the point spread function is from the iodine lines. And uh, this big fat, point spread function. That's from Keck at high res. And it's a resolution of about 60,000. Uh, then this uh, dotted one here, actually this one right here, that's at uh, PFS. That has a resolution of about 80,000. And then this dot dashed one, that's at APF. That has a resolution of 108,000. So. These modern spectrometers are much, much smaller, but they're much more efficient, they have much higher resolution, they have much greater dispersion, they're just in every possible way way better. And finally, everything is fixed. All the optical elements, everything is fixed, nothing ever moves. So for our work, it's just dramatically better. We've been taking data at APF uh, since July. Uh, this is sort of the first uh, month or two of data. This is our favorite stable star, uh, Sigma Draconis. It's, it's, uh, it's got a name, which tells you right away that it's really bright. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this, this is a naked eye star. It's in the far north. It's actually circumpolar. And uh, after the first couple of months, our precision was about 70 centimeters a second. And this is one of the initial planets that's begun to emerge. Boy, the time looks really crappy. The same time and then the same time. I'll have to work on that. Um, but uh, here's an emerging four-day planet uh, that's about 10 Earth masses. So this is a, one of these, uh, these crazy uh, super-Earths. So that's where we're at now. We're, we're struggling to get telescope time on APF. Uh, our group gets 40% of the time, so we get about 140 nights a year. Um, 
and we're just going to robotic mode. Uh, it'll be another year or two before we, I think, before we have really exciting results to announce. But uh, we're, that's where we're at. But for the more distant future of this field, of course, we'd like to be able to directly image these planets. Like I said before, the the really hot thing in this field is to get spectroscopy, and. Uh, so this is uh, an artist uh, rendering of what uh, the terrestrial planet finder would look like. This was a project that NASA said they were going to launch in 2006. Mm -hmm. So for a while I had 2006 here, and then I had 2015, and then NASA wiped it out, and uh, so now I write beyond 2030. <laughs> and um, the, So this is a, a group of a bunch of space-based telescopes that interferometrically interfere the beams to wipe out the central star with the hope of being able to directly image the planet. So uh, this is a simulation of what it might detect. Here's the star in the middle that you're interfering the, the light from the various telescopes to remove the starlight with the hopes that you'll be able to get a planet to emerge. Um, these images are not going to be exciting. You're not going to see aliens waving, you know, from <laughs> espresso bars at the side of the beach. They're going to be, you know, single pixel images. But if you can get an image, you can take a spectrum, and that's exciting, because then you can look for uh, signatures like water vapor, and you can look for uh, things that are out of thermodynamic equilibrium. Like if you could image the Earth from a distance and see water vapor and oxygen, you'd say, wow, I mean, that wouldn't be proof of life but it would be so strongly suggestive that the argument would no longer be prove life's there, the argument would prove life isn't there. Um, you know, if, if life ceased to be on the Earth, the oxygen would go away on a time scale of a few hundred years. It would very quickly get locked up. And uh, so that's what you're looking for for life, is water vapor and things that are out of thermodynamic equilibrium. So here's a, one of these slides that was made up for back in the old days when TPF was supposed to launch. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly what I was talking about. You, you know, you look for spectral signatures of like ozone, water vapor. Uh, you, you look for things like methane, which again is something that can be produced both biologically and there are uh, non-biological ways to produce methane. But in the meantime, there are ways to shortcut this problem, which is that we don't have space-based giant telescopes that can do this stuff. But there is another way to get a spectrum of a star, and I mentioned it earlier uh, with these transit planets. So uh, one of the problems, for instance, Kepler has now found something like a thousand planets, and it's got like a couple of thousand more candidates. But these things are all typically more than a thousand light years away. And they're too far away to do this sort of detailed work. The stars are too faint. Uh, so uh, if you want to find a lot more transit planets around nearby stars with the hope that you can take spectra, so like here's an example, the outer annulus of the star lights from the stars coming through the planet and impressing the spectrum of, of the planet on it. So you want to find a lot more nearby transiting stars so that you can try to get the spectrum of the planet in that way. So there is a new mission which is supposed to launch uh, sometime around 2017. Well, that slide really didn't come out very well. Yeah, too bad we lose the axis. This is just a slide that's supposed to be showing the known transiting planets that are around stars brighter than 10th magnitude, the relatively bright stars that you can hope to do this work on uh, as of March of 2013. And you can see there's only a handful of them. So there's this new mission called TESS, which is supposed to launch in 2017. And it's a relatively small satellite with four different cameras and it goes into this really wacky orbit. So you launch it uh, from Earth, you initially fly it around the moon, uh, and then you get it into this really weird two to one resonance. So it's out of the plane of the Earth-Moon system, and it goes quite a ways out. And it's got these four cameras, wide field cameras, that image onto these CCDs. And they simply stare for long periods of time at single patches of the sky. So, um, you can see here, there's the pole, and there's a spot just off of the pole. And this is the continuous viewing zone. Stars in this zone here can be observed for 162 consecutive days. Uh, stars in this blue zone can be observed for 81 days, and so on. You get less and less coverage as you move away from here. Uh, so in, in the world of transit planets, um, you basically you need three transits to make a detection. The first transit simply tells you something is there. 
uh, but you don't know the period, you don't know anything. And in fact, the first transit might be bogus, it might be due to star spots or some other effect. The second transit then gives you a time baseline, gives you an orbital period. So now you've got a prediction. The second transit happened a week later or a month later or whatever it is. So now you've got a period. So now you can make a hard prediction. Exactly that time interval later, you better see a third one. And if you do, then it's real. Or probably real. <laughs> it turns out there are still ways that you can get a fake signal. But at least at that point, you've got a reasonable expectation that you've got a real signal. And so TESS will hopefully be launching in only about uh, three or four years. And within about two years, we'll have little zones with huge coverage and larger zones with, uh, with reasonable coverage. And it's specifically aiming uh, at very, very bright stars, stars brighter than 10th magnitude, uh, which can be followed up. So I'm, I'm like the lowest level of collaborator on this program. I've been one of the people signed up to try to do the follow-up Doppler spectroscopy. Because what you get from a transit is you get the physical size of the planet. From Doppler spectroscopy, you get the mass of the planet. So if you put mass and size together, you immediately get density. So now you can start talking about planetary composition. You can distinguish rocky planets from gas or ice planets, which is pretty cool. But also, uh, once you've got all of that information, you can then pick out the most interesting planets, the ones that are rocky, that are small, uh, that are around relatively bright stars, and throw all of your resources into trying to get the spectroscopy. So that's, uh, that's sort of the shortcut goal uh, over the next 10 years of trying to get spectra of planets. So again, this, uh, I don't know why this came out so crappy, but um, again, the blue dots show the, uh, the known uh, transiting planets around bright stars as of earlier this year. And the red is what's predicted uh, what tests will find within the next 10 years or so. So I'm going to basically uh, wrap up now. In fact, I'm right in now, this is a good wrap up. Um, this, uh, of course, the, the Drake equation is often referred to as the second most famous equation of the 20th century. Um, and of course, what Frank Drake was uh, trying to do was to uh, predict how many communicating civilizations there are in the galaxy. So this is not really an equation in the sense that E equals MC squared is an equation. This is really more like a list of what we don't know, of our own ignorance. And when Frank uh, first came up with this equation in the early 60s, you know, basically the number of communicating civilizations in the galaxy is just all these numbers multiplied together. And when Frank came up with this in the early 60s, the only thing we knew was the formation of suitable stars. We know roughly how many stars there are in the galaxy. That was the only thing known. And in fact, that was the only thing known until just recently, just within the last 10 years or so. In the last 10 years, we now know the fraction of stars with planets. Virtually every star has planets. That's you know, kind of remarkable, given that you know, 17 years ago, we didn't know the single other star that had planets. We can now say with a great deal of confidence, virtually every star has planets. Uh, and then the number of Earth-like planets, or uh, planets that might host life, per planetary system. And that's where we're at right now. Uh, based on Kepler data, based on uh, precision Doppler data around a, a handful of nearby M dwarfs, uh, we can now estimate this number for the first time. And it's pretty high. Uh, the current estimate is somewhere in the ballpark.